Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to welcome you to the Mini Bible School and to our Question Time panel. We are considering recalibrating, recalibrating justice, worship, and witness. This evening, I'm so pleased to have a panel of people who have experience in this area. Let me briefly introduce them to you. On my left here, I have Kerry Holmes, who's the CAP Centre Manager for uh, Glasgow South. Welcome, Kerry, good to have you with us. Then I have Diane and Dan Kell, who are from Ireland. Uh, they are missionaries in training and hoping to serve God, perhaps even in the Indian subcontinent where they've previously visited. Then I have William and Mary. William and Mary Matar are also in training for future mission, but come from a background where in personal life experience they've seen many situations of injustice and it will be interesting to hear their experiences. And then on my right I have Paul Wilson. Paul is a missionary from the United States working here in the UK with InterServe and we are delighted to have Paul here. He's working with refugees and with asylum seekers in the East End of Glasgow. And he also happens to be a lecturer from time to time at Tilsley College. So welcome everyone, it's great uh, to have you with us this evening. As we look at the book of Amos we discover uh, opening chapters which really speak to many issues of morality and of social injustice. Uh, and I'm wondering if perhaps you could share with us your perspective on injustice in our world today. What, what are the big issues that you believe are part of the injustice in the world today? Let me start with uh, William and Mary as they bring some perspective to that. Thank you, Alan. I think one of the biggest issues today if we face is poverty. We are in a world where there is extreme poverty, people living below the minimum needed to survive. And there's also today extreme wealth where it's not millions anymore, it, people are counted in billions with their wealth. So that is, I think, one of the biggest issues we face today. Um, I think as well for me, the kind of the slavery, modern day slavery, where people are being trafficked um, because they have no choice. They want to get out of the where they live because they need um, a better life or they want to be able to get a job so they can look after people back home and they get tricked into being uh, taken. They come to countries in the West and they think they're going to come for a, a job and then they end up in terrible situations where they are used um, you know, in the sex slave or in other ways as well. So that's a big yeah, area. That's yeah, a scar on our landscape, isn't it? Kerry, what are you discovering about injustice? Um, it's really evident to me every day in the things that we're facing that um, poverty, just like William said, is a huge issue. The inequality between um, rich and the poor is ginormous. Um, there are people that are stuck in a dreadful cycle of debt because of a failing social security system that just isn't able to um, help people when they really need it most, pushes people into debt and it is really hard. We see people all the time that are just stuck in that cycle of living below the poverty line, struggling to survive, borrowing and then it just goes on and on and on and the effects that that has more widely on their lives and on their health, on their well-being, on their relationships, is so far-reaching across all of society. Thank you. Uh, Diane and Dan, what have you seen of injustice in our world today? What strikes you? Uh, I think in a sort of Western context anyway, well, it's worldwide, but um, abortion really has hit home, and especially uh, for us, it's only two years since the abortion referendum in Ireland that went through. Um, and just seeing the callousness and cold hardness of people, you know, am I my brother's keeper? Do I have to care about this? Uh, you know, um, and just just thinking, well, it doesn't matter. Just scrap life and it doesn't matter. We'll get on with our own lives. Um, and, and these poor little children who can't even cry out for their mm. own self um, mm. are the victims of other people's um, greed and, and desires. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would echo what both um, both Daniel and William have said. Um, abortion, poverty, two of the huge issues facing facing our world today. But I think one of the things we see in Amos is a massive indifference um, on behalf of the people, where um, 
if something doesn't affect them, then they don't really care about it. They go through the rituals, but they don't have a change of heart. Um, and I think we see that hugely um, in the West today, that there's an indifference um, and there's a, an individualistic mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's that mindset that really needs to be reset if we're going to, if we're going to be able to address those issues. Thank you. That's a really helpful perspective, not just seeing the problem out there, but the problem with us, that often we are not well disposed towards dealing with some of these issues or, or grappling with them. Paul, what have you discovered in terms of injustice in our world today? Well, it's difficult to add to what's already been said, poverty, human trafficking, uh, right to life issues. Uh, these are all massive issues, but where I think Amos is so helpful is that it helps us take a step back and to see where the root of this lies. And in Amos 2, 6 to 7, the prophet says, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. And this is almost like a refrain in Amos. He keeps on talking about the poor being pushed aside. And some of the commentators look at that, that the way Amos introduces that there. He talks about selling the righteous for silver. He talks about the poor lacking rights or the, the rights of the poor being totally disregarded. And in some ways, this can be a deliberate thing, the rights of the poor being deliberately trampled on, but sometimes it's something that we don't even notice, we don't even know that we're doing, and it's something that's probably been brought to, fore, brought to the fore with a lot of our discussions about race um, that have been happening, particularly in America, but here in the UK as well. And I think what we see in Amos, what it really unveils, what the prophecy really tells us about ourselves, that we're inherently selfish, that we're so con so obsessed with our own needs that we forget to look out for the needs of, of others. And I think what Amos helps us to do is really hear those cries of the poor and to see how we are casting aside or how we're ignoring the poor in our daily lives and draws our attention to that to address some of the very pressing and practical issues, issues that have just been mentioned. Yeah. Dan and Diane, you've got a heart for the poor and your orientation, maybe at the moment, maybe not absolutely certain, maybe towards the Indian subcontinent. Tell us a little bit about what you've experienced uh, before there in previous visits in terms of the big issues facing perhaps the poorest amongst their world. Yeah, well, I suppose the first thing to say is that India is a country that's basically built on an unequal system, um, on a hierarchy caste system mm. where you have this massive division between rich and poor that we've already been talking about um, and where the lowest within the caste system are the, the Dalits or the outcasts, they're, they're seen as untouchable. Um, we've, you've also got a, a big issue with um, sexism and how men are seen as um, essentially higher, higher beings within, within Indian society than, than women. When you can combine factors, so if you have a, a Dalit woman, then that's just a recipe for, for a life of hardship and a life of difficulty. My experience in India is coming from the inside of a hospital, so I suppose that, that shapes, um, shapes mm. um, how I would view things and how I would see the biggest issues. Um, but when we look at um, the broad view of women in society as second-class citizens, there's, there's huge trickle-down consequences of that. Um, Abortion, for example, is, is legal in India. In most states, it's similar laws to here. Um, but um, it's illegal, interestingly, for obstetricians or midwives to um, perform gender determination ultrasounds. So if you go for your scan at 20 weeks or whatever, the obstetricians in almost every state are not allowed to tell you if it's a boy or a girl. Because if they do, um, there is a massive issue mm. with, with sex selective abortion. Now, even though, even though it is illegal, you can see based on the birth statistics that a lot of people are still doing this for money. Um, for example, when I was in the hospital in India, I worked on a, on a project um, where I was looking at statewide statistics and male births accounted for over 55% of the total births in that state mm. in a given year. Um, people don't want girls because they can't provide for the family in old age, they'll need a dowry provided for them, and so the solution is to not have a girl in the first place. Um, other issues then that you also see in the hospital setting um, are the treatment of people with disabilities. And again, when you, when you have a very, very poor population, um, there's, there's no ability to provide for those with additional needs at all. And um, there's no support from the government, there's no social security system. Um, 
for the most part. Um, and then in addition, you've no support from your wider community because people with disabilities are seen as, as shameful, as dirty, as outcasts. Um, and again, in the hospital setting, what you, will, what you will see is that if a family gives birth to a baby with disabilities, or if a young child is diagnosed with cerebral palsy, they will, they will not want the child. They'll want to either abandon it or infanticide as well is, is an issue or a seeming solution. Yeah, this is a big issue right across the Global South um, especially. Uh, and often it's because there's just no facility to be able to care and people don't know what to do. Ignorance can often contribute to that as well. Uh, Dan, there are massive issues on the Indian subcontinent, you know, like, uh, you know, we could mention some of them, domestic abuse and violence, and we talked about infanticide that, you know, William since William Carey's day we've been battling uh, there. Can these issues be resolved, do you think? And if they can, have you got any solutions? Um, I think the answer is, is yes, and I think William Carey is actually a brilliant example of that, you know, the father of modern missions, and yet... Um, he didn't just go over to India with words, um, but he went with deeds as well. Um, and he, he worked from the top down in terms of trying to get some terribly barbaric practices that were around in his day in India um, outlawed. And he got a dozen or so practices outlawed, uh, including you know burning of widows on their husbands, uh, mm -hmm. funeral pyres and things like this. Um, and he, he got them outlawed from the top down, but also uh, he knew himself and he said that uh, unless the root of the problem uh, was addressed, um, outlawing it wouldn't be enough. And so he, he was a man who spread the gospel. He translated the scriptures into six different languages. He, he made dictionaries for the people, gave them written language so that they were able to read and study the scriptures. He, um, he provided you know, uh, hospitals for lepers who were completely you know, ostracized from communities. He um, got Christian widows, he, he got them to marry Christian men again. He, he arranged that for them so they wouldn't have to face a life of poverty um, and, and having no one to provide for them. Um, he, he set up schools so that they could, they could learn and, and that the, the system would eventually um, become better. And he saw many practices of his day um, done out because he realized that transformed people uh, can transform society. Mm. The society won't be transformed without them. And yeah. so there's the need for the gospel to transform people's lives and then the society could be changed. So I think that model of working from top down and bottom up to, to deal with these things um, in the way that William Carey did is a model that can work anywhere, really. Um, yeah, that's a really good do. quote just to go away with. Transformed uh, lives are the things that transform society, isn't it? And there's a, there's a clue in there somewhere uh, for the transformation of the gospel. So William and Mary, great to have you uh, with us. You've come from a very different kind of background to many of us on the panel today, and you've seen firsthand what the injustice can look like. Uh, in Sudan, I was just reading the report um, of the media recently that seven and a half million people are in need of aid in, Su in Sudan, according to the UN. Almost 200,000 civilians shelter in the UN protected sites across the country, and more than 1.1 million people are facing severe hunger according to recent figures by the government and the UN. Sudan has faced some incredible humanitarian uh, crisis over time, sometimes of, of a biblical proportion, uh, famine and flooding and so forth. Um, what can you tell me, uh, uh, how can you explain that? What does it look like on the ground in that kind of situation? Can you give us a taste somehow of what it is to experience that kind of injustice? Yeah. Um... So I was, I was recently talking to some relatives um, there, and um, she she was telling me that the in the last few months the the price of um, so in Sudan you get like bread is very small like you get one loaf and it's very small. So she told me that the price of just one loaf has gone up from one one Sudanese pound to five Sudanese pounds in the last few months, and um, and that's when it's available. So people tend to to go, there's like bakeries and people go and queue up. So you go and you, you queue up for hours. You go early in the morning because you might get earlier in, kind of be earlier in the line and you might get a chance to get some. But when you get to the end, maybe you might get some bread, you might not. That's if you can afford it. Uh, people's salaries, like they, you know, they're not increasing. I think um, there was something about 100, over 150% rise in inflation. Like, so, 
bread is like a staple there. People um, live on bread mostly, and you know, and so to not be able to even afford the essentials, um, it's the reality of, of most people. And they live in, in Khartoum, which is the capital city. So I imagine in um, other areas, in other states, the situation is much worse. Um, we, we have a type of bean dish that this was kind of called, the, it's the poor man's food. It used to be anyone could afford that. You know, this was the most basic and people now cannot even afford that, this most basic bean dish that, that everyone could live on before. Um, so um, there's just long lines for, for things. I mean, when I rang, it was in the evening and she told me my uncle had gone out to queue up for bread. Um, and he's, he's a pharmacist, he's a professional. So um, I don't know what people who are, you know, on low incomes, how are they surviving? I really, I, I really struggle to see how, how they're surviving. And um, I was reading somewhere that there's, um, in one of the states outside, they, they daily feed 75,000 children one meal a day. Um, and that would be their only meal for the day. And I think more and more families are only able to eat one meal a day and they decide which meal that will be because they can't get any more than that. Some of these numbers are difficult to compute, aren't they? 75,000 children. It's like a football stadium of children every day having to be fed. It's, it's... William, our background in Lebanon. Lebanon has been in our news, of course, uh, particularly last year with the big explosion on the 4th of August at the port of Beirut not only killed more than 170 people, but injured thousands of others and left at least 300,000 people homeless. But it also dashed the Lebanese people's hopes for a better future for their country. How can we, how can we today help in that situation? How can we reach out to people on the other side of the world and somehow help our brothers and sisters uh, in facing such difficulty? The situation in Lebanon is um, very complicated. Uh, the background um, has got so many aspects to it. It's international, it's local. Um, I think at the moment, if Christians were to look at uh, what they could do, is the first thing is really to pray that people could use this time when poverty, they are expecting people, 80% of the population, to be below the poverty line. And that this time that people will look around them and realize that their hope is not with the corrupt politicians, it's not with the nations that surround Lebanon, which try and influence the country in, to their own side, but it is actually in God. Um, there is a group of Christians I, I came across recently online that last year before COVID used to walk around the government buildings and pray, and pray that people will turn to Jesus and Christians now in the country are praying that people will turn to Jesus because he's the answer. And they set up a tent back then in the middle square of the, the city center for people to come for prayer. And they said that when people came into the tent, they felt this peace that wasn't around in the whole surrounding area and the square. Um, so definitely the answer is prayer. Um, another practical way of supporting is to actually look for um, Christian charities, re reputable Christian charities, that they could contact and see how they can support and send support there. Um, the, the situation is quite complicated. It, there is no quick fix. And the story with Amos actually reminds me of a situation in Lebanon where the surrounding countries have caused enormous damage, but then the people in there, the politicians themselves, have caused most of the damage. Yeah, Amos doesn't let any of us off the hook, does he? He's quick to point the finger at others, but he's very quick to point the finger at the people of God as well. But really helpful just to be reminded of the importance of prayer and that idea of the gospel transformation that can make a difference in our society. We've thought about a very international uh, perspective just now. I want to bring things back, and we've got two other panellists with us who are working right on our doorstep right here in Glasgow. Paul, good to have you with us. Tell us a little bit, Paul, um, about what steps Parkhead Nazarene Church are taking to try to address social inequalities amongst asylum seekers and refugees. Well, I think the, where it starts is <clears throat> with how we view refugees and asylum seekers. So we really try to put the Matthew, or the Matthew 25 principle into action where we see the face of Christ in the stranger 
uh, who is in our midst. And we really try to practice Christian hospitality to those people who are strangers in our midst. And, and I think sometimes the word hospitality is often misunderstood. We think about that's having people to our house maybe for a bit of food or, uh, you know, um, or maybe some biscuits and coffee after church, but actually we, we think of hospitality as a much fuller thing. And it's this thing where we actually welcome people in, we give of ourselves and actually try to invite them into our community. And um, the other thing about hospitality is that it's reciprocal. So I'll explain what I mean by that with a few practical things. So first we do a number of acts, a number of acts of service to the refugee and asylum seeking community in the East End. So we have a drop-in um, cafe that people can come in. It's a safe place, it's a welcoming place and all members of the community are allowed there. And so people can actually have relationships and meet other people. So there's Scottish people come and there's um, asylum seekers there as well. And that breaks, relationship really helps break down a lot of the barriers. We have English classes for all different levels. We have computer tutoring. Um, we provide meals. We have a food bank where we can uh, provide essentials to people who are facing financial difficulties. And we also have other things like a running group, which helps promote um, good physical health and mental health and also social connections. And these are all um, good activities that we uh, think help the community, but we don't see ourselves as you know, the saviors of the East End. We're not simply in a role of providing. And one of the things that we really want to affirm and one of the things that we really want to communicate through our actions to the East End community is that Asylum seekers and refugees have so much to give us and they are people who are made in the image of God and they have so much that they can bring to our communities and strengthen our communities. So recently we've uh, learned that a bunch of our Syrian refugees were teachers back in Syria and they, we allowed them to start teaching at the church and they were teaching Arabic lessons for people who were keen to learn Arabic and they were able to use their skills as teachers for, for to help people acquire a new language which was great. We have a computer scientist who we had a guy who just kind of casually knew about computers but we now allowed this uh, man from Iran who's a computer scientist to teach IT skills and make use of his skills in that way. Um, we had we helped a Sudanese woman who was a doctor back in Sudan to uh, get access to education and she's now actually working on the coronavirus vaccine rollout so it's of a huge benefit to our community at the moment so there's so much that asylum seekers have to give and I, as part of being hospitable is being humble enough to realize that we have a lot to learn and that we have a lot to receive from uh, a refugee and asylum seeking friends. Well that sounds absolutely fascinating uh, quite a network of things happening uh, amongst a range of different people, different disciplines, and then the interaction that you mentioned at the end there in terms of learning as well as giving uh, just excites me. How, how, what difference does the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ make in the midst of that kind of interaction? Yeah, that, I'm really glad you mentioned that as well, because the gospel is really central to everything that we do. And at Park of Nazarene, we're, it's explicit, we're a church. People know that they're coming to church or know that we're Christians. And I think we welcome in, there's a lot of refugees and asylum seekers who are Christian and maybe we can provide some kind of Christian community for them. There's a lot of people who are Muslim. There's a lot of people who are of no faith, maybe Buddhist. Um, you know, there's a lot of different faiths who come in, but being quite clear about who we are is actually makes that inter-religious dialogue actually a lot easier because people know exactly where we stand. So how does the gospel um, make a difference? Well, I think back to Mark 1, where Mark opens up his gospel saying, this is the good news of Jesus Christ, and then goes on to explain, and it starts with repentance, and then it moves on to tell about, he moves on to talk about all these things that Jesus has done. He delivers people from evil spirits, he heals them, and restores relationships for people. So there's this element of, we see this call to repentance and the call to a new life, but we also see that backed up with actions. And I think that element of the gospel of being both vertical and horizontal, we try to, uh, I mean, it, it's a bit of a cliche, but we try to walk our talk and to not just talk about and be explicit about the gospel. We, you know, we take opportunities to invite people to alpha courses, um, to we're always, we always, we make it clear that we're 
available to pray for people or to pray with people. And so, again, it's explicitly Christian, but in a very opening and welcoming sense. And we're clear about who we are, but we welcome as many people. And I think that is something about the gospel where, you know, it's, it's welcoming, it's opening to everybody, but it's quite clear about what it is, and it quite clearly points to Jesus. So we try to bring all those things together. And I think one other element of the gospel, when we look at this is a step further away, I suppose it's an effect of the gospel. We look at the throne room vision of Revelation 7, where we see a great multitude of people from all tribes and all nations worshiping the Lord. And that is something, it's not just a theoretical thing, it's something that we actually want to see happening in our church and in our community. We want, we want to see people included. We want to see all nations worshiping before God. So that means being active and standing against some of the xenophobia and some of the negative messages that we see and a lot of the fear around refugees and asylum seekers in the East End and they get blamed for a lot oh they're taking our jobs, they're taking our money, they're taking our houses, all things which are untrue but people's perceptions still need to be engaged with and one of the main ways of doing that is through having a place where we can bring people into relationship and at least giving some kind of foretaste of that vision and revelation of all tribes and all nations worshiping before God. Answer. Do you need more workers at Parkhead Nazarene in that ministry? Definitely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds exciting. Kerry, it's hard to get our heads around some of the stuff about injustice, maybe because I'm too privileged. It's definitely, I'm a privileged man. Is there poverty in Scotland today? You know, Christians against poverty. Is there poverty in Scotland today? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, yes, there absolutely is poverty in Scotland today. And you don't have to look far uh, from your own doorstep to find it. Um, we see people day in and day out who are choosing food or heating, uh, who are going to food banks to get food because they aren't able to look after their families properly. And these are people that are working, but are earning such a low income that they can't sustain their families properly. Um, we go into houses where people, they don't have carpets, they don't have internet, they're not able or have the skills to be able to use um, things like that properly because they just have never been taught. They've not learned because of their way that they've been brought up and their circumstances that they've been brought up in. They just haven't had the opportunities to be able to access these kind of things. You know, the kids have been fed through school meals for years and then they then just move into this other cycle of social security and social housing and difficulties and poverty. And as I said, even if um, people are able to find work, and it is great when they can, although our uh, unemployment rate just now in Scotland is really, really high, it's like 4.4%. And But those people that are working are in zero hours, unsecured contracts. Um, they just don't know what they're getting day to day to be able to work and to plan and to organise um, their, their money to prioritise the things that need to be prioritising. It's so difficult. Um, it's so difficult. And yeah, it is really, really easy to see kids that are hungry, families that are cold, um, people that can't afford to go places to meet people, to do anything. Now, I know just now we can't do a lot of that anyway, but these people are then now disadvantaged even further because they don't have access to the things that we have been able to access to keep us, you know, in community with people. Yeah, so Zoom calls and everything yeah. internet-based is suddenly lost. If, yeah, exactly. Um, to them, that's a, yeah. not an option. Yeah, I, I guess a limited experience in this area, but I'm aware of the fact that poverty does not come alone. No. And often it's a very complex situation, even unpicking the cause and effect of these things in our yeah. lives. But um, what else happens in in poverty cycles, you know, in terms of the fallout of that, the impact on people's lives, and how are CAP responding to try to help show that they're against these kind of injustices? One of the things that I alluded to before was just the loneliness and the isolation that people um, are feeling and how that then impacts, you know, all of their lives. Um, nine, 
90% of the people that we have that come to us are already living on an income that is lower than your average income for the UK. And they are just struggling and stressed and overwhelmed trying to manage and maintain their life and what they're doing. One of the statistics that's banded around often uh, in CAP is that one third of the people that we deal with have um, thought about suicide because of the burden of their situation that they're in. And that's huge. That's a huge number of people. But we are faced day to day with people that aren't able to open their door, don't want to open their letters, don't want to answer their phone because they're scared and they're stressed and they just aren't able to continue and have a, a normal life. So they're then isolated again further from society. One of the things that CAP does is that it will always work through a local church so that we can provide community and support through local church with uh, befrienders, inviting people to things. We're obviously a Christian organisation, but CAP will help anybody um, that comes to us. It's the service is free um, and we will obviously help anybody. That, I think, is one of the things that people don't necessarily understand. They think, oh, I need to be a Christian to be able to access this or um, have a Christian faith. But, that, you know, that's not true at all. We will help people from all walks of life and in any situation. Um, but we were always very upfront about who we are uh, and why we do what we do. Um, we go to see people. We will pray with them. We will always offer to pray with them, to listen to them, to take... Uh, their situation and their burdens and give them to God and the way that we are able to speak to people and to be with them and share life with them means that we're able to share the real hope of Jesus with them and actually bringing that light into a really dark situation is something that CAP will never ever vary from that is why that it works with the local church so that it can provide that kind of holistic approach so I work specifically with debt help, but CAP also provides job, excuse me, job clubs to help people um, get the skills and put together CVs and work through that. They also have um, fresh start groups for helping people that are struggling with addictions, not major addictions, but just the ties that bind people uh, even further into poverty. And um, they also provide money education to help people budgeting. It really is a holistic approach to try and help people help themselves to get out of the really hard situation that they're in. But we know that we can't do any of that without the hope of Jesus. And the reason that it is linked with church is to give that community. But people have to believe you know, we have to show them how much Jesus can change their life, how that attitude of our heart has to be so that we can show them how much God loves them, you know. Um, it's difficult, you go into some really hard situations, but there are some amazing things that you can do, like um, help people with furniture and um, carpets and provide food and so many amazing things that we can do, but the best thing that we can do is share Jesus with them. And it's a real privilege to be able to go and help people at the most difficult time in their lives to be able to provide that hope. Thanks, Katie. That's a really helpful summary of kind of CAP's ministry. It gives us an insight into some of the things you're doing and that are being done in our own society uh, to deal with issues of injustice. Of course, Jesus comes with that great statement, doesn't he, in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to the prisoner, to the blind, to the oppressed. So guys, what steps would you advise Christians to be taking uh, so that we can be more effective in making the good news of Jesus both seen and heard in our society today? Let me start with uh, the, the Kells. And you can chip in as you feel free okay um well i i think just something that i was thinking of there is um you know obviously kerry and paul have shared of, of of ministries that are doing things and there's no reason why any christian can't join in with a ministry that's already doing stuff but at the same time 
all we need to do, we've heard about the extent of these problems worldwide, you know, on our very doorstep. All we need to do is look around and find one person, you know, they're not, not hard to find to, 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 to be their friend, to be there for them, to help them out in practical ways um, and to share with them that invitation that Paul was talking about. You know, it's a wide invitation to gospel to come to a feast um, and, and to, to enjoy that feast in the kingdom. Um, I, so I think we can either jo you know, ha join in with those who are already doing the work, but also starting one by one, um, just helping people as we can, because the need is all around us. So the, the, the need is to look out, to see, to see the need, um, rather than being enclosed and looking in, like we've already suggested earlier. Yeah. And I think also, um, like for me, it's, it's asking God for the opportunities. Sometimes I can get so bogged down in my daily life and the busyness of life that I forget to, to kind of look up and see, you know, and, and just asking and praying and saying, God, is there someone I can reach out to today? And um, I mean, at the moment, it's hard to, to do that with lockdown, but is there someone I can send a message to? I can, I can phone today. I can um, email or something that I, you know, and, and just involving God with that and saying, who can I reach out today to? So, I don't think that you can discount the uh, impact that people praying have on all of these you know, situations that we've spoken about. Um, often people think, oh, well, I can't do that. I'm not able to work in that practically and I can't do this, especially older people or whatever. But there is, it's, you know, the power of prayer is amazing and so evident often in our ministries, you know, where um, a prayer request where you think is ridiculous and you think this is, we are never going to be able to help this person through that. We aren't going to be able to, there's no way out of that. And yet from people praying, God has worked through that and he's shown a way, he's opened the door, he's, he's made the thing happen. He's made someone deliver food where it is needed, you know, and uh, when you feel like you're unable to do things practically, then, you know, we must pray. We have to pray. Yeah, I think this is important to remember, isn't it, that God's on the side of the poor and the yeah. oppressed yeah. and the marginalised and the needy. Uh, and we look around our society, we see so much of it. And when we cry out to him on their behalf, then he hears, he has an ear inclined uh, to that kind of prayer and yeah. wants to help. And, and, yeah, that testimony to seeing that happening in real life is uh, very inspirational uh, to offer us opportunity to be involved either practically or maybe even in prayer as well yeah i think they're all really good points that have been made so far and i think to answer your question as well one of the things that we really need is to see this consistency between the message of the gospel and actions that are informed by the message of the gospel and i think if there's a disconnect between those two things then that's where people will maybe hear the gospel but not see it and it and it will ruin or or hinder our witness and i think one of the areas and i think this is one area, one reason why i think prayer is so important is that we need god to work on us as well as we have there's these conversations i think when you read amos you're you're quite i at least i am quite struck by the fact that the prophet is having to bring this to the people because they're unaware that they're doing these things to the poor. They're not aware of what they're doing at times. And it made me think recently we had Martin Luther King Day in the States, and one of his famous quotes was that, it may be well that we have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people who sit around and say, wait on time. And that's a really convicting thing. Um, but there are areas in which we can make better decisions in our daily lives that will help the poor. It could be, you know, something as simple as where we shop, um, where we buy our coffee from. You know, that, that, can, that can be a justice issue. Um, these, can, these can make a real big difference. And I also think we, we do need to be careful. Again, the church d does need to be really careful about the gospel message could be clear, but other messages, we have to be sure that those mes those other messages that we're sending don't contradict the gospel. So, and this can be, again, like I was saying, a, a whole process of prayer and self-examination and repentance to understand where we are miscommunicating. So, it can be, it can be easy to look at, you know, kind of big examples. So, a church maybe won't allow a person of color onto a place of leadership. That would be a very explicit 
kind of discrimination, but perhaps more subtle would be people making xenophobic comments or liking, even just liking maybe a xenophobic meme on Facebook, because people will see what you're clicking on and what you're liking, and that will send a bad message. And I think it can be really uncomfortable to say, you know, I saw you sharing this thing on uh, Facebook about how, you know, the asylum seekers are stealing all our, all our houses. I, I don't think that's true. These can lead to really uncomfortable conversations, and they're things that particularly, um, maybe I can say this as an American, but in British culture, we're, we're, uh, sometimes it can be a little bit hesitant about raising these awkward conversations, but I think they're conversations that we need to have, and even in these subtle things, they may seem small to us, or they might just seem like, oh, they're just ingrained ideas, or that person says that because, you know, maybe they're a bit older, so that's okay. But I think sometimes we actually really need to address these issues uh, head on and say, look, we're talking about this vision. We, we look forward to a time we'll have people from all nations worshiping God together, but we're sending a message that we don't think they're actually welcome in our midst. So let's let our vision of the gospel, let's let what we proclaim about the gospel transform our way of thinking about everybody and how we go about our daily business, all the decisions that we make in our daily lives. It affects, it should affect everything that we do. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for joining us uh, at the Mini Bible School Question Time. Uh, thank you to our panellists who have all made very important contributions to our discussion. I hope that's been helpful to you and to stimulate your thinking. I guess one of the big things about uh, injustice in the world that seems overwhelming and yet the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ holds out hope, uh, hope for individuals to be changed and transformed and by God's grace see our society transformed as well. Uh, certainly Amos, with all his news of judgment and condemnation, uh, was able to hold out uh, a branch of hope, uh, that branch being in the, the raised tent of the people of God, once again established and seeing a just society. Uh, in which to live. We look forward to that day when the King returns to the fallen tent. Good. Thanks for being with us and God bless you. Mm -hmm.